Hello fellow sim racers. Today's video is a project that got quite out of hand. It was supposed to be a simple look back at a racing wheel that I got started on back in the mid 90s, but quickly escalated to a full deconstruction, restoration and modernization. Cast your mind back to 1996. Football was coming home until it wasn't. Warner put out a basketball movie of sorts and Thrustmaster released a sim racing wheel. Times really have changed. My dad bought one of those wheels and it's probably the single biggest reason that I'm here doing this YouTube thing. I don't know what happened to that original wheel, but I have managed to track down another one. If I'm honest, not quite the immediate nostalgia hit I was looking for, and far from reliving those rose-tinted childhood days playing Grand Prix 2 and getting into heated debates as to just what exactly a Wonder Wall might be, no, I'd be lucky if this thing didn't give me a disease. And if it looked like that on the outside, what was I going to find when I cracked it open, or worse, tried to plug it in? So we're going to have to have a look inside because someone else has taken this apart. And honestly, I don't really know what state it's in. I suspect probably not great. The likely reason someone had this apart is because, well, it wasn't working. So let's find out. Dismantling the wheelbase was straightforward. Not least of all because half of the screws were loose. And when I removed the casing, I was overwhelmed by the startling lack of, well, anything on the inside. One potentiometer attached to the wheel shaft, four push buttons and the uh, force feedback mechanism such that it was in 1996. Yes, that, that is a bungee cord you're looking at, the type you might use to secure luggage or fashion some sort of rudimentary catapult. High tech it is not, and as it happens the use of elastic bands wasn't limited to the wheel either. And that is why the shifting feel is, uh, is a bit off. The uh, action of the shifter is controlled by a rubber band that just loops around these two posts here. It slots over the top there and the shifter can move backwards and forwards. Unfortunately, the rubber band has broken. So I guess I need to go and get some rubber bands. Underwhelmed as I was by the engineering on display, I had to admit that it was surprisingly functional. And with the sim racing market being essentially non-existent at the time, I could forgive Thrustmaster for building down to a price. Now, that being said, the T2 set wasn't entirely without innovation, including this quirky feature of the pedals. These heads actually rotate. So as you push your foot down on the pedal, it maintains an angle. That's like genuinely a good idea. Once I was done overhyping the pedal design, I finished the disassembly and began to formulate a plan for how to proceed. Everything looked fairly intact, if somewhat scruffy, and the simplicity of the design gave me some hope that there would be a fairly straightforward restoration. Though there was the small matter of trying to get it to work on a PC that wasn't old enough to rent its own car. Probably best to tackle that first. One of the obvious obstacles standing between me and nostalgia fueled racing action is that modern PCs don't support the old game port standard. In fact, old PCs really didn't support it that well either. And even at the time, you usually had to buy a separate expansion card, usually a, a sound card, don't ask, so you could attach your wheel or joystick to a PC. Once USB came along, we quickly forgot about that whole game port in sound card business and never looked back. Except, of course, for the companies that produced game ports to USB converters. And I found one that I'm told even works with Windows 10 and has the appropriate drivers. Though I must say I was pretty dubious. Words like 486 and Pentium 2 on the box really didn't instill confidence. And then there's that copyright date. So then the only thing to do was to plug it in and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> that I really didn't expect. I mean, what are the chances? After playing around a bit with the various mode switches, I didn't think I was going to be able to get it to work properly. None of the predefined setups really made any sense of the pedals, which perhaps isn't all that surprising, as this really was designed to work with joysticks and not racing wheels. So then I was going to have to come up with a plan B. 
After doing a bit more research, it really did look like there might be some more workarounds, though they would usually involve some other hard to obtain old pieces of tech and getting that to work on Windows 10. So ultimately, I decided to cut my losses and convert the wheel to a modern USB board. Leo Bodner makes a few different types of USB interfaces, and in theory, it would just be a simple case of connecting up the incredibly sparse electronics in the Thrustmaster wheel. And for once, it really was that simple. In fact, the whole process of rewiring the wheelbase took little more than 15 minutes, which really does highlight just how much time I wasted with that whole game port to USB nonsense. Anyway, moving on, I decided to fit the pedals with a separate board so I didn't have to keep the two units permanently connected or to have to worry about adding some sort of inline connector. And with all of that complete, tested and working, I could start to think about throwing everything back together and jumping into a racing sim. Of course, I was getting a little bit ahead of myself. The T2 was still looking a bit worse for wear and did have a certain plaguey patina to it. So obviously it was bath time. And surprisingly enough, a bit of soap and water got the old Thrustmaster plastic looking pretty okay, actually. There was, however, still a little bit of discoloration. So I broke out some automotive plastic trim restore and got it looking, well, you be the judge. Not bad at all. Sure, there was still a screw missing in the front panel while I awaited that Bezos fellow to send me one, and I did have to open everything back up again to use some contact cleaner on the very ancient potentiometers, but I wasn't going to let all of that stop me from firing up the sim. And that brings us to today. Try as I might, I can't get Grand Prix 2 running on the system. I've managed it in the past on Windows 10, but I've been defeated. I tried F1 2021 as well, but it really wasn't digging the Bodner board, so here's a set of Corsa. What a joyous feeling, though frankly quite an alien one. Right out of the pit box, you, you really do miss the proper force feedback. Sure, the wheel does have some self-centering, but since it's on a bungee, the resistance is very, very low to start off with, which actually means that keeping the car in a dead straight line is much more of a challenge than it should be. Worse still, the, the physical balance of the wheel changes as you lift one hand off of it to shift, so it's actually taken quite a bit of practice to resist the natural tendency for the steering to stray slightly whenever I have to shift. Of course, that is massively exaggerated by the Formula One car, which is pretty sensitive to small control inputs as you'd expect, but actually, all in all, this is surprisingly drivable. Maybe I should try something equally uh, red. As I suspected, this is in fact the answer, and driving this little NA Miata feels appropriate since they were still being churned out by Mazda in 96. Unsurprisingly, the more forgiving steering rack really does make things a lot simpler, though the lack of clutch pedal means that I'm having to rely on the dreaded auto clutch. Counterintuitively, I actually miss the force feedback more with the Miata than I did with the F1 car. Not being able to feel out the grip limit totally destroys the fun in a car like this, but I have to say it really is um, functional. All in all, I think I'll probably stick with force feedback. Still, I wish I managed to get Grand Prix 2 working. <laughs>